But it's great to have Elena with us from uh, from the Ukraine, uh, originally from the Ukraine, and uh, just wonderful to have you today. But uh, you're very welcome to join us uh, at the end for uh, tea and coffee, and everyone else uh, as we have a time of fellowship a little bit later in the service. Well, keep your Bibles open there uh, to Jeremiah, or open them again to Jeremiah chapter 36. Jeremiah 36, and there we have one of the most terrible acts recorded in the Word of God. Jeremiah had been prophesying and had written down the prophecies of this book, and it was brought to the king, the king Jehoiak Jehoiakim. And Jehoiakim uh, takes a penknife, and the list read it once more. Uh, it says there in uh, Jeremiah 36, verse number 21, it says, So the king sent Jehudi to fetch the roll, and he took it out of Elishama, the scribe's chamber, and Jehudi read it in the ears of the king, and in the ears of all the princes which stood beside the king. Now the king sat at the winter house in the ninth month, and there was a fire on the hearth burning before him. And it came to pass that when Jehudi had read three or four leaves, he cut it with the penknife and cast it into the fire that was on the hearth until all the room was consumed in the fire that was on the hearth. <clears throat> Here we see uh, there's a, a, a brazen king who takes the word of God and treats it as rubbish and actually burns it. And he, he, but it all began with him taking a penknife to the word of God. You know, there's many people of the same attitude as Jehoiakim today and who have always had it when it came to the Word of God, and as it's preached, as it's presented. And uh, as we continue, this is our fourth week in our series on excuses that I've heard. Excuses I've heard on the street. And one of the, we couldn't do this series without talking about this one. Uh, the, the, one of the most prevalent excuses that you hear when you're trying to give people the Gospel, trying to tell them about the glorious message of the Word of God, about, of the Bible, they say, you just can't believe that Bible nowadays. You can't believe that book nowadays. And that's an excuse. And, and over and over, they've heard it, they, re they repeat it, and uh, they, they just throw the whole thing out altogether. There's so many in, in seminary. You, you may have heard it in seminary. You know, in, in the old days, the common person had a respect for, for church. They had a respect for God. They had a respect for the Word of God. And not the only time you would find somebody saying, this is not the Word of God, you don't have to listen to this, is maybe in some university somewhere, some professor would be saying, they'd use something called higher criticism. <clears throat> and that started, uh, well, it's always been going on ever since Satan said to Eve, hast God said, you know, did God really say that? But especially in this country, the preachers started going off to Europe, to seminaries there that started teaching higher criticism. And they, in a sense, were taking a penknife, and they were saying, you can't trust this part of the Bible. Sure, you can believe this part, but you can't believe this part. Yeah, these are some good ideas here, but we don't really believe that actually happened in history like that, like the Bible says it doesn't. They started taking a penknife to the Word of God, just as Jehoiakim did, says here, until finally, nowadays... Just as Jehoiakim, he, he started one leaf at a time, taking the penknife and putting it in the fire, until the whole thing, he, he had, eventually he had put in the fire. And that's exactly what's happened in society today. They just take little bits and pieces of the Bible, they undermine it, and preachers started preaching like that in the 1800s here in this country, until, uh, until so many just went along with it, they didn't fight against it, until whole denominations were swallowed up into apostasy, and they say, you can't believe that book anymore. And so now the common person just says, just throw the whole thing out. If you take the pen knife to the, to the Bible, eventually that's what happens. People just throw out the whole thing. And uh, so many, they, they never actually have read the Bible itself. There's so many proofs that the Bible is the Word of God. So many sermons. And so much proof, abundant proof, that the Bible is what it claims to be. And uh, yet people have never thought about those things. They've never read about those proofs. They just re read what's, been, be, what's repeated around the Internet and that type of thing. 
and uh, but they've never actually read the Bible itself, and so it's so easy for people to tend to just go along with this popular delusion that the Bible is full of mistakes, that it's no longer relevant to modern society. And this, you hear that excuse so often. And yet, the Bible itself, in the Bible, the writers of the Word of God, the human penman, repeatedly, over and over again, claimed that they were transmitting to us the very Word of God that's infallible, that is authoritative. And uh, it's amazing... Thing to claim that this is from God, that it's that of course God cannot lie, and to, so does God cannot make a mistake, and so to claim that that He in the, in the Word of God made a mistake and that, that there it's full of mistakes, that's a, a terrible claim to make. Of course, these people were making an amazing claim that it was perfect, that it was infallible, that it is inspired, and if these forty men who wrote the Word of God were wrong in those claims then it is not, it is not a good book, and yet we know it is a good book. It's changed the world, this book. Uh, they, they were, what, what was it? Were they lying? Were they insane? Or were they telling the truth? Those are the questions that we have to make. But the Bible is the most, of course, even secular people will tell you, the Bible is the most beautiful book. Books. The Bible uh, is the most beautiful book of all time. It's the most influential book of all time. It's governed... The, it's, it's the ultimate moral code for societies throughout all of history. And if you can't find meaning in the Bible as the king of all books, then where else are you going to look for meaning and purpose in life? There's no other book that comes even close to the Word of God. It is the only place that you can find real meaning and purpose in life. You know, their claims to be inspired by God they are justified over and over and over again. And uh, By the way, over 3,000 times in the Bible, it claims to be the Word of God. The Word of the Lord came unto me. The, the, the prophets said that uh, over and over and over again. They were claiming to have uh, the Word directly from God. Now let me just read you some things that people have said about the Bible. And let me ask you, what do you think about the Bible? What do you think? Now, what you believe determines your behavior, doesn't it? What people believe about the Bible in Great Britain today determines how people act in Great Britain today. It really does. What we believe about life determines our behavior. Our beliefs impact our behavior. And so if we believe the Bible, then we should be living according to the Bible. We should be reading the Bible. It should, we should be obeying the Bible. And yet people have a lax attitude about what the Word of God is and where it came from. And so they have a lax attitude about reading it and about obeying it and about trying to behave according to it. But the Bible, let me read you some quotes. George Mueller, he said, The vigor of our spiritual life will be in exact proportion to the place held by the Bible in our lives and in our thoughts. Now what place do you give the Bible? Is it the king? It's the king of books. Is it, does it rule in your life? Charles Spurgeon said, No one ever outgrows the scripture. The book widens and deepens with our years. And that's true. It, it, you can never, we can never get to the full extent of, of the Word of God. Robert E. Lee, in the middle of the Civil War, said, In all of my perplexities and my distresses, the Bible has never failed to give me light and strength. And it never will fail you either. President Woodrow Wilson during World War I said, I am sorry for the men who do not read the Bible every day. I wonder why they would deprive themselves of the strength and of the pleasure. John Bunyan in prison uh, in Bedford here said, I never knew all there was in the Bible until I spent those years in jail. And I am constantly finding new treasures. And with the Bible you'll always be finding new treasures. Walter Scott, Sir Walter Scott says, the, the most learned, acute, and diligent student cannot in the longest of lives obtain an entire knowledge of the Bible. The more deeply he works the mind, the richer and more abundant he finds the ore. And John, John Adams, the president in America, said that, uh, so great is my veneration for the Bible that the earlier my children begin to read it and love it, the more confident, confident I will be 
that they will prove to be useful citizens to their country and respectable members of society. The Word of God and uh, the impact that it makes in people's lives. Now, the Bible claims to be inspired. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. It's profitable. It's in, but it says there, all of it is inspired. It's inspired. That it's, it's the only reliable source that you could ever find of who God is. How would we know who God is if He hadn't revealed Himself to us? We would never would know. This is not something that men made up, but it's a revelation of Himself, of His Word to man. And the Bible shows us not only who He is, but what He's like through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He came to, from heaven's glory, the eternal Son of God, to be born of a virgin in Bethlehem's manger. He lived a sinless life. He died for our sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. He rose again. He came forth from the grave. He's alive forevermore. He sits in heaven for us. And the Bible tells us who God, what God is like through the person of Jesus Christ. It tells us why we're here. It tells us where we came from. It tells us everything that we need to know. The Bible is not everything that God knows, but it's everything that God wants us to know about Himself. And uh, it tells me where I'm going as well. These questions that are inside of each one of us, deeply rooted that there is a real heaven, there's a real hell, and the Bible tells us these things. We wouldn't know anything about heaven unless the Bible had revealed it to us. No wonder the devil hates the Bible with more passion than we could ever even imagine that he hates it. Because it tells people about a real heaven, about a real hell to avoid. The devil hates it. And so the devil puts everything he possibly can into attacking the Bible. If you're going to be, if you preach the Bible, if you try to spread the Bible, if you try to live the Bible, the devil will hate you. And he'll attack you. And so these questions deeply in, deeply planted inside of each one of our hearts, they can only be adequately answered in the Bible. The devil hates it. He tries to destroy it. Think about uh, uh, the Roman Emperor uh, Diocletian. Diocletian in uh, 303 AD, he said he was going to remove every copy of the Word of God from the face of the earth. And he was going to remove every Christian as well from the face of the earth. In fact, he even set up a monument, Diocletian did, two years later, that said, Christianity has been extinguished from the face of the earth. Did he succeed? Did the devil succeed? No, he did not. In fact, just a few years later, in 312 AD, uh, Christianity had continued to spread, and it had spread so much that uh, Constantine said, wow, I can't stop it like all the other emperors have tried to stop it. And uh, he said, my empire is fracturing. So he, he said, I'm going to declare that Rome is a Christian empire. You know, of course, we don't believe that he exactly knew what he was talking about, Constantine, when he said he was a Christian empire. But, but it, the, the point is it had spread throughout the whole empire in, in spite of all of Diocletian's efforts. You think about Voltaire. Voltaire said, I'm going to... Uh, say that Christianity is dead. And he gave his whole life to saying it, and he even said at the end of his life, Christianity is officially dead. In fact, in uh, Paris, they set up a, uh, a, a, an altar to the God of reason, and they said, they, they went out and they took everything from Notre Dame Cathedral into the streets of Paris, and they ground it all up and broke it all up, and they said, Christianity is dead. But you know what is now in Voltaire's house, it's a Bible printing society, is now set up in Voltaire's house. He could not stop Christianity. Uh, John Wycliffe, here in England, uh, he wanted the common man to be able to read the Bible. He said, one day, even the plowboy at the plow will know more of the Bible than the Pope does. Uh, he wanted to bring it into English. And so he translated the scriptures so that everybody could read the Word of God. But he was so hated that the, the Catholic Church ordered during the Inquisition that he would be killed. And they hated him for putting the Bible in the people's hands. But before they could reach him, uh, he, went into, he went into hiding and he finished, he finished what he was doing. And then uh, they never did get him. He died peacefully. 
But they were still so angry, they went to Lutterworth, uh, there on the way to uh, Neneaton, and they dug up his bones out of the church graveyard where he had done all that translating work, and they ground his bones into dust and put them in the fire and threw them into the little stream that goes by the graveyard there. And uh, they thought they would erase his memory and what he had done. But uh, as, uh, as John Fox said, his bones went into that river and then into the next river Swift and then into the river Thames and then into the ocean and around the world. And same thing with the Word of God. They couldn't stop it. It went all around the world from this place, from England. <clears throat> they couldn't stop it. And so uh, they, they tried to get the Word of God stopped. The devil hates it, but he cannot stop it. Uh, but he attacks it. He attacks it with all sorts of uh, uh, everything imaginable to try to attack the Word of God. You know, at one time there was no Bible in, in the world. What would the world be like without any Bible? Well, we can find out what it's like in the book of Genesis. Before the Bible was written, there was no written Word of God. Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. It says that at that time, they multiplied, the people multiplied, there was no written word of God at that time, and it says, every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And so without the restraining of the word of God in society, that's what it came down to. Every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Adam's race went astray. Uh, his... Uh, uh, Noah and his three sons and their wives were the only people that were spared from God's wrath at that time. And so what brought them to that condition? There was no written revelation. That was, that's what a world looks like without the Bible. You know, we live in a wicked world. I'm sure you would say, you know. It's, wickedness is all around us. It, it, it's, uh, but it's not because we don't have a Bible. We do have a Bible, but it's because we've neglected our Bibles. Wickedness has grown as we've neglected the Word of God. As apostasy has come in, wickedness has grown. As people start doubting the Word of God, and denominations turn away from this so important doctrine that the Bible is the inspired Word of God, that it's infallible, that it's, there's no mistakes in it at all, as, as denominations have turned away from those things, wickedness has grown in society. You know, we're just if the devil can just remove one generation from, from the Word of God, he can start to capture their minds and he can start to get them to make a revolution against God in their minds and against the Bible. And that's what we're seeing all around us. But what does the Bible say? What's the testimony of the Word of God in itself? <clears throat> and uh, first of all, let me say that the testimony of it is that it is inspired. Now, what are some proofs of this? That it is the very breath of God. This is the breath of God. This was not cunningly devised fables, as Peter says. The Bible tells us in 2 Peter 1, verse 21, For the prophecy came not of old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So how do we know this? Uh, well, first of all, let me say that prophecy, fulfilled prophecy, is, is one reason that we know that the Bible is the Word of God. And I could spend the next... 12 hours just going through a list of prophecy after prophecy after prophecy that the Bible has literally, been, has literally seen fulfilled. Nobody else could do this. Nostra, Nostradamus, he had like some vague prophecies about the future and uh, just very, they always proved to be false and also all sorts of other uh, people like uh, Gene Dixon and pe these prophets, you know. But they're just so vague, they never really get fulfilled. But the Bible is in a totally different category to all other books as far as prophecy is concerned. Think about just a few of them. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24 to 27, gives an amazing prophecy. Daniel's, Daniel's uh, 70 weeks there. And uh, in that prophecy, Daniel, it was given in 586 B.C., and Daniel says that the Christ that Israel is waiting for, this promised Savior, this promised Prince, he's going to come exactly 483 years after the Persian Emperor gives the Jews the authority to go and rebuild Jerusalem. And that was fulfilled to the letter, 483 years after. That's when Jesus came. That's one of the most amazing prophecies of the Bible that predicted to the exact year when Jesus would come. 
And uh, let me give you the reference again, Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27, Daniel 70 weeks. That, that 483 years after the Persian Empire, and by the way, the Bible even named which, what the Persian Emperor's name was going to be in the book of Isaiah, uh, in Isaiah 45, he says it's going to be a man named Cyrus. And it gives the name of the emperor 150 years before Cyrus was even born. Isn't that amazing? And, uh, of course, there's so many other things. That, that's one of the most amazing prophecies. But there, just Christ himself, Christ himself fulfilled over 300 prophecies, literally fulfilled in his first coming. And by the way, he still, there's still even more prophecies given about his second coming. So if every one of those 300 prophecies was fulfilled about his first coming, don't you think that all of the things about his second coming will come to pass as well? Mm -hmm. So many things that the prophets have said uh, are referring to his second coming, which will be actually two comings. Uh, coming in the clouds for his saints and coming um, uh, to the earth with his saints later on, seven years later. And the one in eight verses of the New Testament as well talks about Christ's second coming. And so there's prophecies that have been fulfilled and yet to be fulfilled that will be fulfilled when the time comes. Uh, but of course we see that uh, there's all sorts of other prophecies in Ezekiel 37 verse 22 and Isaiah 11 verse 11. Uh, Jesus said in Luke chapter uh, 21 verse 24, these are prophecies, a whole family of prophecies concerning the Jews coming back to the promised land, to, to Israel. And a whole family, the restoration of the Jews to their land. And we've just seen that happen in our life, in our gen just one generation ago, 1948, is that right? 1948, the Jews did return to their land. And uh, we see all sorts of other prophecies about individual nations and individual empires. There's, there's prophecies in Daniel about the different world empires, about Alexander the Great. and all. You know, Alexander the Great was going to come and conquer Israel, but somebody opened up the book of Daniel and say, hey look, the Bible talks about you coming and doing this right here. And he was so impressed that he, he passed by Israel and he didn't attack it, he didn't take it over. And uh, just as the Bible said he would. You know, all sorts of prophecies that no other book you know, the, the Quran, Confucius' writings, none of these other books uh, could even compare at all. The Quran has no prophecies. Confucius j just gave general ideas, you know, and yet the Bible is in a totally different category. And only the Bible is like this. And it's on such a tremendous scale that you could never come to any conclusion other than it's divinely revealed from God. And any other conclusion would be totally absurd. It's the Word of God. You know, we think about also the accuracy of the Bible in history. You know, the, the, the records that are given in the Bible are so far superior, superior than any of the Egyptian records or the Assyrian records or the Babylonian records. They are just were fragments. But the, every time the Bible gives a historical fact, it is uh, confirmed by archaeological digs and of course, we wouldn't need that. We, we, you know, but the Bible, it's not blind faith that we have in the Bible. Mm -hmm. It's not blind faith. It, but uh, here's a man named Nelson Gluick. He's Israel's leading archaeologist. He says, No archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. In fact, scores of archaeological findings have been made which confirm in clear outline or in exact detail historical statements in the Bible. And by the same token, proper evaluation of biblical descriptions has often led to amazing discoveries. You know, nobody has ever found any uh, archaeological thing that has discredited anything in the Bible. In fact, there's a book that you can buy from the Metropolitan Tabernacle. And I, in fact, there's another version of it you can actually buy from the British Museum. And it's called Things in the British Museum that Prove the Bible. You know, you can just go one day and look at these historical accounts of where things are and when things were, and you can find that they all match up with what the Bible says. Of course, there's uh, lots of other things that we could talk about. The, um, the uh, principles that are given in the Bible. The Bible's not a science book, but when it mentions science, 
it records these things as facts, and all the principles that uh, all the scientific principles that the Bible does record as facts are uh, things that are that were later on confirmed when scientists saw them experimentally. They couldn't see that the Earth was round. In fact, nobody else believed that the Earth was round, and yet the Bible said the Earth was a circle in Isaiah 40, verse 22. How did they know that? God must have told them. Uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, which we're going to look at tonight, uh, it talks about some, some scientific facts. Um, in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, it talks about things that they had no idea about until uh, the weathermen started studying these things. But uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 6, talks about the, uh, the atmospheric circulation. It says, The wind goeth toward the south, and turneth about unto the north. It whirleth about continually, and the wind returneth again according to his circuits. How did they know that? You know, in satellites can see these whirlings of clouds, but, but, but uh, Solomon, in his wisdom from God, was able to record this 3,000 years ago. And uh, also it says uh, in verse 7, All the rivers run into the sea, yet the sea is not full unto the place from whence the rivers come, thither they return again. So it talks about the rivers of the sea. Uh, in Psalms as well, it talks about the rivers and the paths of the sea. There's these ocean currents that they didn't know about. But it also talks about um, the sea is not full because the water goes back to the place where it came from. And it talks all about the, uh, the hydraulic, uh, hydrologic cycle there in the book of Ecclesiastes. In Jeremiah 22, verse 22, it says that the, the stars are innumerable. They're vast. You can never count them. Of course, back then, they thought probably thought we could count the stars. But now, with telescopes, we realize we could never count the stars. There's more than we could ever count. And yet, Jeremiah, he, he knew that. Job 26. Look at Job 26, verse 7. Now, there's several from Job, but let's just look at this one. Job 26, verse 7 says, He stretcheth out the north over the empty place, and hangeth the earth upon nothing. How did he have this advanced knowledge? This is the oldest book written in the Bible. That the earth hangs upon nothing. This gravitational uh, field around the earth. It just hangs on nothing. Well, it was revealed from God. Leviticus 17 says that life is in the blood. There's something important about uh, life. And life is not possible without blood. And yet in the old days, they thought the opposite. They thought if you're sick, you'll just have to drain some of your blood out. And uh, that'll help you. But... Uh, uh, but the Bible knew about that in Leviticus. And uh, all sorts of other things about how things are... are Psalm 102 talks about this, the idea of entropy. Um, 2 Peter 3 verse 7 talks about uh, uh, mass and energy and all, all sorts of things in the Bible. But of course it doesn't use all these scientific technical words. It just presents them in everyday language of man. Because the Bible is written for all time and all people. And so it's written so that, not in modern scientific language, but it's written so that everybody could always understand it in every generation. So no one has ever presented a mistake, a genuine real mistake, from the Bible. There has never been any mistake demonstrated in the Bible. Not in science. Now there's lots of things that science tries to bring up. Good to see some, some girls. Girls, you can come on back to Sunday school if you like, if you want to come straight to Sunday school. Good to see you, Renee, and your friends there. And uh, But, you know, next week we're going to talk about the idea of, well, I believe in science, you know. And uh, that people saying that science has contradicted the Bible. And we'll, talk, we'll spend a lot more time next week on that. But no, there, there's never been any true uh, mistake recorded in the Bible or in history or in any other subject. You know, there's been many mistakes that people have claimed, but every single one of them, uh, real Bible, people who believe the Bible have always been able to study the Bible and to see that there's a reasonable uh, solution to every single one of those problems. And, uh, and so the Bible takes these uh, facts of modern science and records them as facts. And then another thing is the remarkable structure of the Bible. Think about the Bible, 66 books written by 40 men over a period of about 2,000 years or so, 
and yet perfect unity in the Word of God, the perfect consistency. Each, of, each one of those 66 books fits perfectly into place. Either each one has its own unique purpose. Uh, each one complements each other, complements the whole. It's just such an intricate book, such a systematic and symmetrical book. And you can never explain that away by chance. You can never say that these 40 men colluded together to write this book because they lived over a period of 2,000 years. They didn't know that their book that they were writing was going to be one day part of the word of this complete word of God. And yet God was bringing them all together and he was, he was doing this. And we think about the remarkable structure of it. The, the claims that the Bible makes for itself. It was not made by man. Let me read you 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13 says, Which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth. Comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So these words that Paul is giving in the New Testament, he's saying, they're not words that my own wisdom comes up with, but they're words that the Holy Ghost teaches. And look at the emphasis again there in 1 Corinthians 2.13 on, the, on that expression, words. Words which God teaches. You know, the Bible, every single word of the Word of God is the Word of God. You know, that's why we're supposed to give attention to all of the Scripture. Not just say, yeah, the ideas are right, but the, the, but the facts are not right. No, every single word is right. It's trustworthy. Every single part of it. You know, the apostles, they believed that the Old Testament was, part, was the Word of God. The apostles uh, used the, New, the Old Testament when they preached. The, the, the New Testament would not make sense without the Old Testament. And the Old Testament would not be complete without the New Testament. It all works together. And the, the New Testament writers, they quoted from the Old Testament constantly. And uh, the, the, the Bible is... Uh, they believe that the, the Old Testament was the Word of God. Uh, in, in all of its parts, you know, um, the Bible says it's the Word of God over and over. It declares itself to be the Word of God. And if we want to know the truth, the truth that sets us free, the Bible claims to be that truth. That's what it is. The Bible says it's settled in heaven. Psalm 119, verse 89, Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Before any one of those 40 men took pen to paper, Every word that they were going to write was settled already in heaven. Uh, you know, but yet people say, these professors will say it's full of error. Uh, they'll say it's not true, it's archaic, it was written years ago, it's not relevant, and yet the Bible says that forever it was settled, it's never changed, it's the Word of God. And uh, anybody who doesn't believe the Bible is not going to go to heaven, they're going to go to hell. If you don't believe that the Bible is the Word of God, you cannot be saved. Uh, the Bible is the Word of God. It's the only way that you can escape. It's the only revelation anywhere in the world of how to escape from hell and how to be saved from your sins. Jesus said in John 5, 24, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death. On the life. You have to hear his word, he said. If you don't hear it, if you don't believe it, then you're you're not going to go to heaven. And so as Christian people, we don't need to back down on this. We don't need to say, yeah, well, maybe not all the Bible is the word of God. We need to not forsake our position. We need to be loving, we need to be compassionate, we need to be kind and Christ-like, of course, but we have to be uncompromising. And we have to say, the Bible is the Word of God. It will never change. And uh, we think about the testimony of the Bible itself. But secondly, we think of the testimony of Jesus. Do you believe Jesus was who He said He was? There are preachers who will stand up and they'll say, well, we don't really believe that this miracle really happened. We don't really believe that Moses wrote the book of Genesis. We don't really believe all these things. And yet they, they claim to be Christians. But if they, if they believe that, then they're saying that Jesus Christ is a liar. In Matthew 12, verse 38, uh, Matthew 12, verse 38, he, he, Jesus clearly says that he believed that Jonah was a real person who really didn't get swallowed by a whale. 
And so if there's some modern day preacher who says, well, we believe this is just allegorical, then they're calling Jesus a liar. And yet they're claiming to be a Christian. But in, uh, Jesus said, uh, an, adul an evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. For as Jonas was in the was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Jesus said, this is a true account, and he, said, he even said that uh, my death, burial, and resurrection is a picture, uh, what happened to Jonah is a picture of my death, burial, and resurrection. So he was saying this was an historical thing that happened. The Bible's historically accurate. You can trust it. And it's going to, it's, it's a picture of something that is else is going to be a historical thing that's going to happen in the future. My death, burial, and resurrection. And then he talks about the creation. You know, there's, there's preachers who say, yeah, I believe the Bible, John 3.16 and all that, but Genesis 1, God created the heavens and the earth. They say that's just a bunch of baloney. But uh, Jesus Christ said in Matthew 19, verses 3 and 4, the Pharisees came to him and they asked him if uh, it was lawful for a man to put away his wife for any cause. And he answered and said to them, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Jesus said that God made Adam and Eve at the beginning male and female. He, so Jesus obviously did not think that they... He said they were made at the beginning. Not after millions of years of evolutionary processes. He made them at the beginning. Jesus believed that. And of course we know who Jesus was. He was the eternal Son of God. He was uh, God come in the flesh. And Jesus Christ declared that the Bible was true when it says that God made Adam and Eve. And, and yet these preachers, they claim that that's not true. And what they're doing is they're claiming to know more than God himself knows. Mm -hmm. They're, they are uh, denying the Word of God, and they're foolish, and the congregations that follow them are foolish for following those preachers and for going to those churches. But, uh, so, but we need to have no apology when we say that we believe. We can just say, we believe what Jesus believes. We believe that the Bible is the Word of God, and it's completely trustworthy. And in, in Noah, G, people mock at Noah. People, people knock the idea of the, of the flood. And yet Jesus Christ said, As the days of Noah were, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered the ark, and knew not that the flood came and took them all away, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus is saying, this is not some sort of allegory. This is real things that happen, and I'm using this as an illustration of another real thing that's going to happen, my historical return when I come back to the earth. You know, let me give you a tip. Just take the Bible for what it says and believe it. And if, if there's sometimes the Bible does use poetry, and sometimes it does use symbols, but just Take the Bible for what it says unless it's obvious that it's using symbols. And the Bible will interpret itself on those symbols and you'll be able to figure out what those symbols mean. And yet some of the Christians, they say, we can't read the book of Revelation. It's all allegory. It's all symbols. And yet uh, in the book of Revelation, it's, it's one of the most self-interpreting books in the Bible. You can find out exactly what it's saying. And, uh, and yet people are so slow to believe what the prophets have said. That's what Jesus said on the road to Emmaus to those two disciples. He said, Oh, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Let's not be slow of heart to believe what God has spoken. And then finally tonight, uh, this morning I should say, uh, that the testimony of the Bible itself, the testimony of Jesus Christ, but also the testimony of all those people who have trusted the Lord concerning the Bible. So many people who have been able to trust the Lord. And the testimony that, that comes from knowing Him. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3. We, we, I quoted verse 16 earlier. Let's look at verse 15. It says, And that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So T saying, Timothy, I'm writing to you because about the Bible because it's the Bible alone that can make you wise unto salvation. He says, because you have the Bible, because you had the Bible when you were a kid, you heard about salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ. It wasn't for the Bible. 
You would never know anything about it. And so, you know, everybody who is saved in the room, we could all stand up and we could say that it was believing the Bible that changed our lives. Believing the Bible made a huge difference. How many times have you ever heard somebody say, well, I read a math book and it changed my life, or I read a chemistry book and it changed... No, but there's people throughout every generation, every tribe, every nation that the Bible's gone into. There have been people in every language group that the Bible's been translated into, almost 3,000 languages the Bible's been translated into, and there's people in every single one of those tribes who have believed it and who've said it's changed my life. The Bible works in every nation, every language, for every type of background. Rich people, poor people, kings and commoners alike have all put their faith in what the Bible says. And it has changed people's lives, it's changed nations. You know, it, it's not just understanding the Bible, that's not going to bring you salvation. Uh, the Bible has to be believed and then it has to be obeyed. And then you put your faith in Christ, and that brings you salvation. People say, well, I don't understand the Bible. I don't understand what it's trying to say. Well, the Bible is very clear that you have to, first of all, uh, have faith in what it's saying. You have to obey what you do know in the Bible before he'll give you more, um, uh, more things. You know, there's, there's so many people, they, they, they don't believe the Bible. They, they could read it a hundred times, and they still wouldn't get it because they've never put their faith in Jesus Christ. They've never, they have some objection, some objection to the Bible or some objection to Jesus Christ or some excuse, and so they will never be able to get to the real heart of what the Bible is trying to tell them. That's exactly what the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.14. It says, The natural man receiveth not things of the Spirit of God, but they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. So if you're able to come to the Bible and say, there is, it, it is possible that God exists. It is possible if God exists that He can speak. You know, how do you know what God says unless He speaks? How do you know what I'm thinking unless I speak? So God used also, He used words to speak to us, to communicate to us. He did, He can, He did. And so if you come to God and say, is this true? Are you speaking to me? If you come to Him and try to find find Him, he, you will find Him. God does not play hide and seek. God does not try to make this Bible some secret code that you have to, you know, you have to, He, he makes it available to all. And, uh, you know, if you come to Him, the Bible says, without faith it is impossible to please Him, for he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Hebrews 11 verse 6. And so there's so much evidence in abundance for the inspiration of the Bible, more than enough to satisfy anybody if they're interested enough to investigate it, and yet they don't want to investigate it. That's the real thing. That's the real reason. Because they're afraid that they'll have to believe it. If they do investigate it and they find out that it's true, they'll have to believe it and they'll have to obey it. And so that's the real reason. That's why people hide behind these excuses. The Bible's not for today. The Bible's full of contradictions. Natalie was working at McDonald's in Corby, and a Muslim man said, your Bible's full of contradictions. And so Natalie had heard somebody else do this, so she had a Bible with her at work, and she had handed it to that Muslim man and said, okay, show me one. And he couldn't show her one. Of course, I've done that before as well. No one can show you one. Of course, they, they might repeat something in, in our modern day of, of computers, they might just copy and paste something that they've heard some excuse, but they haven't really thought about it. And none of these, if you really think through these excuses, they don't hold any water. And uh, But the real reason is they don't want to obey it, they don't want to have faith in it, they don't want to uh, obey it, and they don't want to study it to try to figure out what it says. So that's the thing. If you, It's not just enough to understand the Bible, you have to believe it, you have to obey it. So what about you? Do you know that the Bible is the Word of God? Uh, can you have any answer for all these amazing uh, attributes that the Word of God has? None of, us, if, if, none of us has any answers, but are you willing to say, if it is the Word of God, I'll believe it. If it is the Word of God, I'll obey it. The Bible says, uh, not to only be hearers of the Word, but doers of it. Uh, 
Now, the Bible says that we're supposed to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so if you study the word of God, like I said, the Bible's not some secret code. Uh, but if we study it, we'll figure out what it means. The meaning is clear. Of course, you can never... You can never. Uh, the, the amazing thing about the Bible is you might know what it means, but you'll always be. It, it'll always get deeper and broader and more wonderful the more you study it. So you could study it your whole life, and you could start seeing all those wonderful connections because you can't understand one book without another book sometimes comparing them. And so as you study the Bible your whole life, it'll just open up more and more to you, and you'll start seeing all the connections. And and if you, as Rob said last week, if you study it and you you don't understand it, just Move on until you find something that you do understand, and eventually you'll, it'll all fit together in your mind. It's an amazing book. You know. And finally tonight, it's been preserved for us. People say, well, it's, there's too many confusing uh, translations of the Word of God. And I've really run out of time. I've got uh, less than 30 seconds <laughs> to, till 12 o'clock. But uh, you know, pe people say, with all these modern translations of the Bible, that are available now. We should just abandon the King James Version. And, uh, you know, that's... It's, the, Bible, the devil, as we said, hates the Word of God, and there's all sorts of voices trying to deny its authority, and, to, and the devil tries to attack it, and this is one way that he's attacked it. And, uh, you know, why are there so many different translations in the English? There's still languages that don't even have any of the Bible. We should be working on getting it into those languages. Mm -hmm. And yet they, they've made, they made dozens and dozens and dozens of translations into English. Why have they done that? There's only a certain number of ways you can translate the same words. But uh, they have, they, each, each translation has to be 20% different than any other translation in order for them to get a copyright on it, in order for them to make money off of it. Mm -hmm. And so that's why they, uh, they have to change the words. Because mm -hmm. they have to be a certain amount of differences to, for them to get money. And so, uh, <clears throat> you know, there's no need for all these different translations. The Bible is quite clear that the King James Version is pretty universal. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty simple. There's lots of one-syllable and two-syllable words. You know, there are some these and thous and things, but those are actually pretty easy to, to, to figure out what the these and the thous means and, and the words that end with th. You know, the, the, in fact, they're even more accurate in, in their tenses, and also there's, there's a reason for each the and thou, if it's plural or singular and all those types of things. But uh, the people who made these uh, tr modern, tr modern translations, they had a low view of Scripture. Most of them had a low view of Scripture. Most of them did not believe that it was the infallible Word of God. And they, uh, most of these uh, modern translators, they didn't have any commitment to faith that the translators of the King James Version had. They had a, a reverence. We've talked about this all before, I know, but it's important to, to remember that uh, you know the, Bi the Bible was written for us in English. It's not really as archaic as people say it is. You can't understand the Word of God. And uh, especially, it's a spiritual book, especially if the Holy Spirit helping you. But the main reason is that uh, the King James Version was based on a Greek text called the Textus Receptus, and uh, they were they that means the major, and it was the majority text, the received text, and they would copy it, they would circulate it, they would hand all these out, they would use them everywhere, and so. Everybody was using those copies, and they were reverently copying them. And there were so many copies around that if there was one copy that was wrong, they could recognize it and fix it and, and get rid of it. And uh, and so, but uh, it, the ones that were right, they would recopy and distribute and use, and so they're not as old. And so there were a couple of new copies that they found, one in the Vatican and one in Sinai Desert, St. Catherine's Monastery. The Sinaiticus, and they said these are older, but they they were just isolated, but isolated, and nobody ever copied them or used them or distributed them anywhere. So they just sat there in the desert sands, and nobody ever used them. And it really in a in a rubbish bin is where they found this. Now it sits in the British Museum, and that's what they use for all the modern Bibles because it's older. So that's why we don't we believe the older the new translations are not reliable because they're from that corrupted. 
text. And you can look at it in the British Museum. It's full of uh, errors. It's full of alterations. You can even see where they have made, um, and it, you know, they they've just added things deliberate alterations, and, uh, and so we believe the King James Bible is still the most accurate, reliable translation. God has preserved His Word, and uh, there's no good reason to say that the, there's all sorts of errors in our Bible. There's, it's been preserved for us. The Bible says in Psalm, uh, Psalm 12, again, the words of the Lord are pure words, as silver tried in a furnace of earth, Purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord. Thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. We have the pure, preserved word of God. Let's pray. Father, we pray that this has been a beneficial morning uh, as we look at this excuse that so many people bring up. Father, we know that uh, your words will never pass away. Heaven and earth will pass away, but your words will never pass away. Help us to stand up for them. Help us not to give in to the, to the tidal wave of assaults on the Word of God. Help us to have, some, have something to say about the testimony of the Bible for itself, the testimony of Christ that, that the Bible is what it says it is, and our own testimony that has brought us salvation. Father, I pray that we can receive the Word of God as it is. Help it to make us wise unto salvation. Help us to put our faith in it. Help us to do it, not just hear it. And help us to obey it. Uh, Father, we pray that as people uh, we, we, we pray that as people all around us are dying and going to hell that you'll help us not to uh, be sick, to be brought down by the attacks of the devil and say we can't give it out to people but help us to know that it's trustworthy and so that we can give it out and save people's lives from an eternity in hell. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing together page 426 as we close.